Hi, my name is Andrew Francis and today we're continuing on by looking at Isaiah chapter 13. In chapters 13 to 23, Isaiah is now prophesying the fate of the nations. In doing this, he's making it clear that they and their ultimate destiny is in God's hands. Throughout this next section, the Hebrew word Massah, which literally means burden and is sometimes translated as oracle, occurs quite regularly. In the previous chapters, Isaiah has pointed to Emmanuel as ruler of the nations. Because Emmanuel is ruler of the nations, Isaiah, whilst announcing God's judgment on them, is also in effect announcing God's salvation for his own people. As we consider chapters 13 and 14, which address Babylon, whilst no doubt there is an historical context in which Isaiah is addressing Babylon itself at the time, more than this, we'll see how Babylon is used throughout Scripture as an expression of human pride and arrogance. The unit of oracles from chapters 13 to 23 ends with an attack on Tyre, and Tyre represents human commercial endeavours. Though interestingly enough, in the book of Revelation, we find that the description of Babylon is very similar to Isaiah's description of Tyre. In essence, this section of Isaiah is, in Oswald's words, expressing that all human pride and accomplishment are under God's judgment. It also needs to be pointed out that Assyria is still the main superpower at work at the time that Isaiah is prophesying. Though at the time of these prophecies, Sargon II had lost control of Babylon, and Babylon was desperately seeking to make alliances with any nations willing to do so, so as to resist any further Assyrian domination. So I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 13, verse 1 to 5, the oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. On a bare hill, raise a signal, cry aloud to them, wave the hand for them to enter the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones, and have summoned my mighty men to ex execute my anger, my proudly exalting ones. The sound of a tumult is on the mountains, as of a great multitude. The sound of an uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathering together. The Lord of hosts is mustering a host for battle. They come from a distant land, from the end of the heavens. The Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Isaiah, whilst being aware of Assyria's dominance, could see that the real threat to Judah was actually Babylon. And so even before Babylon has overtaken Judah and brought her people into exile, Isaiah is prophesying her destruction. It is God himself who is calling together his army. They have been consecrated by him, and even though the army will be made up of men from other nations, the Medes and the Persians, as we'll discover, just as Cyrus, a pagan king, is later said to be anointed by God to do a task, so are the men of this army. This army will be a massive army, drawn from far and wide. Not even the natural barriers of mountains will provide protection from the onslaught. It reminds me a little bit of 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15 to 17. When the servant of the man of God arose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And so in some senses, this is a perspective that Isaiah wants to draw the, the eyes of God's people to. That whatever the superpower is at the present time that seems to be surrounding us, it too will come under God's judgment. It too is nothing compared to any army that God can raise up, both of men or even of angels. And so we continue on in Isaiah chapter 13 verses 6 to 18. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near, as destruction from the Almighty it will come. Therefore all hands will be feeble and every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed, pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labour. They will look aghast at one another, their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. 
I will make people more rare than fine gold and mankind than the gold of a fear. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. And like a hunted gazelle or like sheep with none to gather them, each will turn to his own people and each will flee to his own land. Whoever is found will be thrust through and whoever is caught will fall by the sword. Their infants will be dashed in pieces before their eyes, their houses will be plundered and their wives ravished. Behold, I am stirring up the Medes against them, who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter the young men. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. Verses 6-8 to eight expresses complete human helplessness before God's judgment. All the things that we have come to rely on as people will prove to be useless. Wealth, education, military superiority will prove nothing before God. As Matthew chapter 10 verse 28 warns us, And do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Likewise, Hebrews also warns us, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It later says, Our God is a consuming fire. What seems so powerful to us as weak human beings before God is weak and pathetic? And Babylon, a world superpower, after Assyria, will seem like water before God and his army. I often hear people, Christians in particular, worried about worldwide conspiracies and powers at work behind the scenes, seeking to seduce us and force us to take potentially one day the number of the beast. But if we take the prophet Isaiah seriously, then in many ways Isaiah is letting us know that whatever powers are out there, are really nothing before the might of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. With the coming of the day of the Lord, all light will be taken away. The earth will be thrown into darkness. Where God is, light is. When God has withdrawn his presence, light also will be absent. Likewise, in the ancient world, the moon and the stars were understood to be gods. These gods will be shown to be nothing. Any glory that the moon and the stars have is a reflected glory that ultimately comes from the one true sun, God himself. Further to this, instead of human glory covering the earth with its population, its wisdom, its technology and the like, humanity itself will be reduced to almost nothing. Remember, it's human pride that leads to this. A young lady was expressing to me the other day some horror as to what she was reading in this particular passage. And of course, if we take this passage at face value, it seems as if it is God who is unleashing his anger in such a way that the raping of women, the smashing of children, is somehow his will. And yet, this is not the case and can never be the case. Nonetheless, when human beings refuse to acknowledge God and his ways, then it is inevitable that women will be raped and children murdered. In our own society, which is as godless as any society in the world, in the name of pride, politicians and people fight to impose their sexual preferences upon others, as if this is the reason why people were made, simply for their own pleasures. At the same time, we find political sanctioning of the murder of up to full-term babies under the dubious claim of women's rights. We will happily sanction the ending of the lives of the elderly and the disabled and the mentally ill under the polite label of euthanasia. And then we'll express shock that women are sexualized and children are abused. Why should we think that the sort of society that can do one evil will not also do all sorts of other evil? Jacques Olaul, the French philosopher, in his book The Politics of God and the Politics of Man, writes, Unfortunately, what is normal now that man is separated from God is war and murder, famine and pollution, accident and disruption. When there is a momentary break in the course of these disasters, when abundance is known, when peace timidly establishes itself, when justice reigns for a span, then it is fitting, unless we are men of too little faith, that we should marvel and give thanks for so great a miracle, realising that no less than the love and faithfulness of the Lord has been needed in order that there might be this privileged instant. As Romans chapter 1 tells us, the judgment that God puts us under is by giving us over to the very thing that we think we want and we think we have a right to. In Romans chapter 1 verse 28 to 32 we read this, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetous, malice. 
They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. If you understand something of what Isaiah is saying, he is saying God will indeed stir up an army against Babylon, who will do all these terrible things to Babylon. But in some senses, whether it is from external forces or even internal forces like we're seeing in our own nation, because of Babylon's failure to acknowledge God, such things become inevitable. And so we read the final verses of chapter 13, verses 19 to 22. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there, no shepherds will make their flocks lie down there. But wild animals will lie down there, and their houses will be full of howling creatures. Their ostriches will dwell, and their wild goats will dance. Hyenas will cry in its towers, and jackals in the pleasant palaces. Its time is close at hand, and its days will not be prolonged. In these last verses, Isaiah prophesies the end of this pride-filled superpower. It will be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were reduced to nothing within a day. They were never rebuilt, and indeed Babylon itself was never rebuilt. I think there should be both a warning in these words, particularly for us as believers, as well as a word of hope for us. Just as John Oswald pointed out, these words against Babylon are not simply about the destruction of a wicked superpower which imprisoned God's people. They are also words of God's deliverance and, soup and, and salvation from such a superpower. But as Christians, we have to be careful that we don't put our hope in worldly powers, whether they be trusting in a nation like the United States of America, the previous president they had, such as Donald Trump, which some Christians saw as some sort of answer to prayer from God, or even a Christian prime minister in our own nation, such as Scott Morrison, or the wealth of our nation, or any of these Babylonian things. God may well raise up a nation like China to humble us, and the Western world, with all its pride, its its um, immorality and its idolatry. When we see movements such as gay pride, transgenderism, the constant push towards the seduction of our children into ungodly ways, then we know that our God will also deal with such things when he's ready. Whether you are living in the final times, the very last of the last days or not, the message of Isaiah accords with the message of Revelation and lets us know that Babylon with all its pride, its wealth, its seduction and its power will be destroyed so quickly that all who see will be amazed. In Revelation chapter 18 verse 10 we read, They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. As John Oswald states, God's glory will fill the earth, not humanity's. If we will not learn that voluntarily, we must learn it involuntarily. God bless you.